Hello folks and welcome to another episode of After Hours Woodworking. I'm your host Chad Stanton and on this show I like to talk to you a little bit of what I got going on in my shop. I answer some viewer email questions and I like to give a tool suggestion that might be useful for you and your shop. Okay now I took last week off uh, because I was in West Virginia for the first annual Heritage Farms and Museum Woodworking Festival and I was honored to be the guest speaker there and so I, I went down but anyhow just a great time a great time but uh, unfortunately as I was driving down there uh, I got some I got some bad news um, getting a little choked up saying this some of you that follow me on uh, Facebook saw that uh, my good friend, our good friend, Les, uh, passed away, which really caught me off guard. Uh, as you know, I go over, went over there every Tuesday and Thursday to help him, and he had sent me an email on Sunday saying, uh, you know, hey, Chad, can you come over a little bit early on Tuesday? I really want to get a lot done in the shop. And, uh, yeah, sure. I was, was there on Thursday. He was actually down in the shop, you know, working with, with me and Dennis. He was, he was doing actually pretty good. And then, you know, Sunday, he was asking me to come over early on Tuesday. Um, Monday morning, Dennis calls me and said Les was put in a facility. And, uh, you know, I was like, well, well what happened? Well, where? He says, well, they, they haven't really said where. Just, uh, you know, you... you, you wasn't doing well, and I said, "Well, can you find out? I'd, I'd like to go. I'd like to go see him, you know, one last time." Uh, and before Dennis could, you know, get back with the family, because I'm sure it was very hectic, uh, he called me as I was driving down to West Virginia Thursday and said, he, "You know, he passed." And I know it's not a surprise to to uh, you know know that that was coming. We, we've known it for months. I just I, I feel like I let him down. Sorry, I feel like I let him down because I, I know he really wanted to get that high boy done, and we were so close to having it completed. Um, we just had to sand and, and finish it. But uh, well, we tried anyway. So Les will be greatly missed uh, in in our lives. But uh, the nice thing is that. Myself, Dennis, and hopefully viewers like you will continue doing this wonderful craft. This is what really kept Les going and encouraged in life was doing woodworking. And I just hope that I die as, um, as satisfied as, as he was. So anyhow, okay, moving on. No more, no more talk on that. Uh, let's see. Okay, let's, let's, uh, Let's do a couple things. I've had people asking me about my, my shop, so it's not quite done, but I know you all are getting a little bit anxious, so here, let's, let's just do a quick shop tour, and then I'll come back and we'll, we'll answer some of your emails. So let me show you around. So when I come in my shop, the first thing I'm in is the area which I've kind of cornered off and designated for my uh, spray booth. These are the sliding uh, barn doors to it and for now for now I just have this fan mounted here where I can put a filter in front of it and then I have a tarp up on a track and the tarp pulls out it actually folds down it covers the ground and everything and then I can use my HVLP in here which by the way it's so great that the that Erlax uh, spray gun that I have virtually no dust hanging around after I spray. It's great. So even though I got the fan there, it's really not even pulling a whole lot through the filter. Uh, these are some tabletops that I'm making for a local restaurant. 
and I'm using the, uh, for the first time, I'm using the Crystal Lac uh, top coat on it. It's the stain and top coat. It's been really nice to work with, and in that uh, Erlax gun, it sprays really nice. So, all right, let's uh, move on to the next part. Well, you can see here I have my um, miter saws, and people have asked me in the last video, that, that fireplace mantle video I did, they asked me why I have two. And to be totally honest with you, it's, it's for when I do crown molding. I hate flipping this back and forth to make those cuts. And so I, I usually just set, set them each at opposing 45 degree angles and I can make the, the cuts without really too much of fussing with it. Um, you can see here in the back, I have some of my hand tools here displayed. Uh, you know, I just like collecting this stuff. I don't really use the axe a whole lot, and Lord knows I can only use so many hand planes, but I just, I just keep collecting it. Maybe one day this will be a, a museum or something. This is obviously my main work area, uh, my main workbench, uh, the, the tools that I use pretty often. This is just a folding table for now, but this is where my new bench is eventually going to be, the one that's going to be the version of Dennis Laney's bench. Uh, I'm going to have a bench here, so one I can walk all the way around, and then this one is probably just primarily going to hold my tools so that I can work on it. So let's take a look at this over here. So I've got my mortising machine, a drill press, the uh, planer, joiner, some storage cabinets, of course, more old tools up there. Uh, the, you know, the essentials for kind of what you need to have to build furniture. Nothing fancy, nothing real modern and new, but yet they all work just fine. So this is the area that I'm going to have my lathe. At this point, I don't have it here yet. It's still in the old shop. It's old. It's heavy. I have to completely disassemble it, bring it here, and put it back together. Um, but that's where it's going to live. Right now, this is just kind of a catch-all. I, I have to build a, a clamp rack. It's going to be one of the projects that I do around here. I want to build like a sanding station. Uh, again, something else that's going to be a project to do around here. Um, and then just over here, just on the other path, side of the, the door, uh, I'm going to have a storage locker so I can put my film equipment and stuff in there. Um, and I have the, the ceiling heater hanging up there that heats this place. So, yeah, that's most of it there. And, of course, right in the heart of the whole shop, right in the middle, I have my two table saws. Um, that, that, that old Powermatic, that, that Powermatic goes back into the 80s. That's got my designated stack uh, dado on it. Uh, this here, table saw, this is a Hitachi. Uh, this has got uh, just a singular uh, forest saw blade in it. Uh, next to it, I have my router table, and it, I have everything hooked to one switch for the vacuum down there. Uh, this is pretty much where I do most of the work. And so I, what I like to do, it's a little bit taller than ergonomically set for me, but uh, that bench in the back, this bench here, and then there's going to be a bench on the other side. That is, uh, they're all going to, the workbenches are all going to be the same height as the table saws. That way if I got a long uh, piece of wood going through, kind of acts like an outfeed table. It worked well for me in my old shop, and I think I'm going to keep that going uh, in, in this shop as well. And then we wind up right back where we started here, right in the middle, right behind the big uh, barn doors there. This area I like to keep open. This is where I assemble, I build, I can bring material in and just lay it out and organize it if I have to. So this is always going to be trying to kept open. And uh, hopefully next year, come spring, I'd like to be doing some small classes in here where I'll have some uh, small workbenches set up so we could work around in this. So anyhow, uh, that's, that's the shop tour.
Okay, so that's what I got so far. Uh, as you can see, it's still little things to button up. Uh, some things I want to still add and continue doing. Uh, it'll probably always going to be one of these things that's always evolving and moving, but uh, that's, that's where I'm at with it so far. Uh, some viewer email questions. So, Sean uh, Aranios uh, asked about replicating some molding. He's got a, uh, a project that, I don't know if the molding's missing or he's just trying to make it, but the molding that he showed me, it, it looks like it was cut from a shaper. So it had a, a large profile made, and he's like, what router bits do I use? I have lots of router bits for this. I don't, I don't know how to duplicate it. Well, sometimes you can't. Uh, these profiles and shaper heads, they change all the time. Uh, getting a custom shaper head made just for a little bit of a molding is really difficult. So what I told him he could do one of two ways to do it. He could uh, break each profile down on that as an individual piece and then glue them up together. And that's probably the best route to go. And you will get it either right on or really, really close. In my case, many times I'm asked by um, my clients to replicate old historical moldings. And again, it may not be for a long piece. It might just be, you know, eight or ten feet. It's not worth having a, a shaper head made for that. So what I'll do is I'll take the, take the molding and I, I make a profile template out. And in many cases, I use... Uh, an old saw blade that's that's just junk of like a framing saw blade out for my circular saw and I trace it and I cut it out with a grinder and files and stuff and then what I'll do is I will get uh, most of this most of it hogged out with either a, a router table saw I actually like to use hand planes but then to get it even and consistent all the way across <clears throat> I will take this and it becomes a scraper and you just keep doing it and take off any high spots and it'll wind up being perfect and it's it's an old method that can be used to replicate any kind of molding out there it's really pretty cool uh, customers are always impressed and amazed and it really does not take that long not at all so there you go, Sean. I hope that helps you a little bit on replicating some moldings. Okay, I lost the name of this person. It was a good email question, so I wrote the question down, but I lost you in the email, so I'm very sorry. So I don't know who this next one is from. But the question was that he's uh, getting into using some hand tools and wanted to know, could a card scraper... Could a card scape, scraper uh, do as good of a job and, re and or replace a smoothing plane? And just for the record, um, I'm going to say that each one of these have their own purpose. Uh, someone might argue with me out there and say, yes, Chad, you can substitute one for the other and vice versa. Uh, I'm just going to tell you how I use them. Uh, first of all, if you've got a small project a little box or something, uh, absolutely, a card scraper would be great. You can use this, get a nice smooth finish, um, and, and you'll be quite pleased with the results. But if you've got something bigger, like a tabletop, you're not going to want to use a card scraper on it. Uh, not only are you going to be constantly trying to put that burr back on it because it doesn't last that long, um, but it's going to get real hot, too. They don't hot to the touch. So uh, that's where a good smoothing plane is is worth having. Now, for years, I've used uh, my uh, Stanley number 4. Great, very affordable. You can pick them up just about anywhere, $25 to $45. Um, one that I think is better is a Miller Falls number 9. If you can uh, get your hands on one of those, it costs a little bit more, maybe around $50, bucks, $35, $50. Um, very nice, better than I, the Stanley, I believe. But I, uh, I got the Wood River four and a half here. And uh, let me tell you, it's heavy, which is something I normally don't like in a hand plane. 
because I know people say, well, Chad, you want it heavy so it stays down on your work. Okay, but if I'm planing a lot with it, that's getting heavy, just lifting it up each time. Um, but I, despite it being heavy, this thing does a great job. I get really, really great shavings out of this. Uh, it's a little pricey, around 150 bucks. But if you want to make an investment, one that's going to last you a lifetime, it's definitely worth it. So, uh, where do I use my card scrapers? Uh, I primarily use a card scraper, and I prefer a card scraper with a little bit of a, a curve to it. I primarily use this for trouble spots. If I've got something on the wood that a little bit of tear out, or a small nick, or just a problem area, I can go in, scrape that out, feather it out, um, and then I then I still finish with I still finish with sanding. So I typically go hand planes, card scraper, sanding, and then done. So I hope that helps answer your question on card scrapers or smoothing plane. All right, this last one uh, is not so much an email question as it was kind of a comment. I thought this was a really good point. This comes from Jeff Burton. And Jeff was saying that he took his um, surface planer and he changed the blades in it from the regular straight blades to the helical blade. So the helical blade is a bunch of little teeth and it goes in a spiral. And there's some real advantages to this. Now, uh, if you don't have a surface planer and if you've never experienced planer snipe, uh, that may not be a familiar term to you then. But essentially what it is is as the board goes through the surface planer, as it gets to the end, wow, what was that? Something with my light uh, <laughs> scared me. When it gets to the end, it kind of uh, cocks the board just a little bit and it digs in a little bit deeper. So what people tend to say is, oh, we'll have a longer board than what you want to use, run it through, and when you get that snipe, you just, you just cut that off. Uh, that works. The other thing I do, too, is as the board is coming out, I just lift up a little bit on the board, put a little pressure, because what's happening, the board wants to fall down, and it takes this, the snipe out. So if I just lift up on the board as it comes out, I pretty much reduce my snipe right there. But... The really, really cool thing about the helical teeth on it, the helical blades, are with a regular surface planer with that straight blade, you have to pay attention to the direction of the grain going through. You have to think about that blade coming down to the wood. And just like when you hand plane, you have to be going in it the right way, otherwise you're going to get tear out. With a helical head on it, doesn't matter. Because it's a spiral action, you can put it in any grain direction you want and you won't have any tear out. So they're pricey, but they really make a, a, a good investment. And, and that was Jeff's point. Jeff was like, Chad, I know you try and not focus on really expensive tools, but how many people get frustrated because their tools aren't performing well for them. And I thought that is an excellent, excellent point. So if you have the money to invest in it, that's, that's great. Um, because the whole idea is we want to not get discouraged or frustrated in this craft. We want to be improving and learning and benefiting from it. So thank you for that, Jeff. Okay. Um, should you own it? Should you own it? The where I do a tool suggestion for you. Now, I actually don't have um, my results to this yet, but I got from, I got from uh, McFeely's this Craig, the DIY project kit. It's, it's three things in one. So it's, it's the small little junior, and I haven't even opened this yet, so that's how new this is to me. Uh, it's like the little junior pocket hole kit. You clamp it on a board, drill it in. Uh, I have one of those. They're great for when I work out in the field. I want to take my big uh, foreman machine there. So I know that's going to work really well. Uh, the other one here 
It's for a shelf pin. It's, for, it's a, an alignment jig for spacing out your shelf pin holes. I have something uh, here from Wood River. It does, it does okay. So I'm curious to see if this is going to be any faster or any better. But the one I'm really excited about is it's here. It's the, uh, the jig for my circular saw. Uh, it's it's uh, what they call it. It's called the rip cut. Uh, essentially, I, I can attach it to any circular saw so I can cut, uh, you know, large sheets of plywood. Now, dang, ooh, I just lost the light. Oh, I lost both lights. I think I blew a fuse. <laughs> Well, I'm down the one light. Um, something on the cord shorted and just, just, wow, it just blew it out. So that's crazy. So I'll have to get that fixed. Anyhow, like I was saying, uh, I'm real, real excited to try this, this jig out on my circular saw. You know, I have that Festool uh, saw, the track saw. I honestly, I find that Festool tracks are really limiting. It, it works exceptional on plywood, but I can't use that saw just if I wanted to grab it and cut a 2x4 or something. Um, my circular saw is, is still pretty handy to have, and it looks like uh, this jig is just going to make my circular saw even better. So I'm curious to see how uh, quick it aligns up with my circular saw, how accurate the settings are, um, and and I just heard, I'll get you some more info on this next week, uh, Craig is coming out with like a longer version of this, like, like a track saw, uh, that you can just get the pieces and in increments and make it as long as you want, and boom, you turn your circular saw into a track saw. I just saw that from McFeely's. They, they sent me a link, so as I find out more, I will let you know. So I'll be real, real curious to see how this goes. Um, you know, right off the bat, thinking with the holidays coming, uh, regardless of, you know, what holidays you follow, this might make a, a good gift to give. So I'll keep you posted if, if I like it or not. So, um, all right, so I think that's where I'm going to wrap it up this week. If you have any email questions, feel free to write me at woodshoppingtime at gmail.com. I'll do my best to answer your questions and get back with you. And as always, thank you for watching and keep on dancing. <laughs>